Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. We have another great plant hangout plan for you this week. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. But before we get started on today's hangout, I have big news, everyone. Our own Dr. Jason Calari, the JWST project scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, has released, or earlier this summer, had released an audio segment for Academic Minute on exploring exoplanets, and he is up for a Listener's Choice Award. And so I'd like to, have, to give a shout out and ask you guys if you want to support, help support some of the JWST mission, I put a link to where you can vote on his audio segment down in the, in the description box on both the G Plus page and the YouTube channel. So please click on it and look for his, uh, look for his segment, listen to it, and if you like it, give him a vote. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to uh, support the JWST project and Dr. Jason Calari. So I, I encourage you to, to check it out and, uh, and let us know what you think. Uh, I'd also like to take a minute on behalf of the Space Telescope Science Institute and give a big congratulations to ESA's Rosetta team. Yeah! <laughs> because yesterday they successfully landed the Philae lander on Comet 67P. That's all I'm going to call it because I can't ever pronounce the rest of the stuff. It was so awesome. It was. It was I was watching it, the separation end and the landing live, and I'm just like, no, on the edge of my seat. Like Can, you believe, it? Can you believe it? it we awesome. are on a comet now. Yeah. We live in the golden age of astronomy. Wondrous <laughs> times. Anyway, congrats to all you guys. Wonderful work, and we look forward to seeing some science that comes out of this stuff. So, anyway, th good job, guys. Um, okay, today's Hangout. Have you ever wondered how people point the Hubble Space Telescope, how do you use this thing? How does it work? I mean, we learned a couple of weeks ago that there's not astronauts up there uh, steering it and driving it around. We, as far as I know, there's not little hamsters on wheels running around up there. So how do you point and use the Hubble Space Telescope? And how do you talk to it? What do you, how do you know if something's gone wrong? Well, today we've got some NASA, we've got some engineers from NASA Goddard who are here to help answer all of those questions and tell us how the Hubble is operated on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, before I get started, though, let me uh, introduce my cohorts, Dr. Carol Christian from the HST. Uh, <laughs> she's the HST Outreach Scientist. She's here actually with every week. Hi, Carol. Hello. And soon to be doctor one day, anyway, uh, Scott Lewis uh, from oh, Northern Buffalo. I, 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 I don't know about that. Oh, okay. Well, it was a goal yeah, at one I don't hate myself that much. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Uh, he's also here to help us drive the internet and do all things uh, uh, social media. So welcome, Scott. And while we're on you, why don't you give everybody an idea how they can interact with us during this Hangout? Yeah, so uh, the, the biggest way to interact with us, which is allows us to answer your questions, is on the Q&A app. So we have that enabled on both Google Plus and YouTube. If you're on YouTube watching it embedded somewhere, it'll be on the lower left-hand side in the yellow link. It pops up, and you're able to ask questions, and we're able to select them and answer them live on air. Uh, you can leave us uh, our comments on the event page on Google+, Plus or comments on YouTube. We will be seeing those. And I am monitoring the Hubble Hangout hashtag on Twitter and be uh, sending out a bunch of other things out there, too. So we'd love to hear your comments and questions over on the Twitterverse. Awesome. Well done. So let me introduce our guests. Let me start. We have three engineers, all of whom are in the control room of the Hubble Space Telescope, the nerve center, if you will. Uh, I'll start with Scott Swain. He is a systems engineer in charge of keeping all of the science instruments working. It's his job to keep an eye on all the science instruments to make sure that they're working properly and to install new software uh, to, help them do, to help them go even better. So welcome, Scott. Glad, glad, I'm ha glad to have you here. Also with me is, uh, is Mike Wentz. He is uh, in charge of the fine guidance sensors on Hubble, and we'll talk about what those are as the Hangout uh, progresses. Uh, they're responsible for, hold for keeping Hubble pointed super uh, accurately, uh, so uh, he will be talking to us about those. Hi, Mike. Hi. Glad to be here. Hi. Thank you. And uh, Morgan Van Ars Arsdell, did I pronounce that right? Got it. And ours, okay. She uh, she works on all of it apparently. She's in, uh, she works on everything. So uh, she's going to give us she's she's really going to give us a sort of a look in all the different aspects. But most importantly, she's going to talk about what they do when something goes wrong on Hubble and and how they handle it and how they know. So welcome guys. Uh, so let me get started with. Uh, well, let me just start with you, Mike. Or I'm sorry, Morgan. Um, why don't you describe for us where you are right now? Where are you sitting? Okay, so we are in the Space Telescope Operations Control Center. Uh, this room that we're in right now 
you can see, um, I'll hold my computer up just for a second. You can oh, see okay. a lot of different banks of computers, a lot of stations. Um, and during activities, if we're installing a new flight software or we have a problem going on, this room will be full of systems engineers looking at the data and sending, watching commands to the telescope. Um, in the room right next door to us is the mission operations room, and that's where day-to-day -day controlling and commanding comes from. Um, so we can, that's where the flight ops team sits when they're doing operations. That's also where we ha is really the heart of our automated operations. Um, oh, that's the room where you don't want to be hitting Control Alt Delete. I take it, right? right? Exactly. That's where yeah. the really computer sits. <laughs> okay, so um, so Mike, why don't you give us a little background on what you do, what you do, and uh, what your responsibilities are? Well, okay, I'm responsible for what's known as the fine guidance sensors on the telescope. These are actually they're, they're, they're three separate instruments. Um, this is our infamous uh, Hubble model. The instruments are actually placed about 90 degrees apart around Hubble. Um, so I'm actually one of the guys who actually has three separate instruments that, that I, I get responsible for. Um, and these actually help, help do the final bit of holding Hubble locked on a target. Um, to be able to move the telescope, um, it, it moves in very interesting ways. Um, and to be able to lock on, it takes actually a multitude of different instruments working sort of in there. But the fine guidance sensors are the last ones, and they actually what lock it on. So those Perfectly aligned for those very very long period of time. Okay, I want to get to I want to get to some of the specifics of how Hubble is pointed, and in particular the fine guidance sensor. But uh, uh, so, but but for now we'll just say that these are detectors that are on the focal plane of the telescope that are responsible for keeping track of stars and nearby objects to make sure they're pointed very precisely. Correct? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, um, Scott, yes. science instruments, all of them, really. You're oh, really? Wow! So you're the man. If uh, if if stuff if this stuff goes down, uh, you're having a bad day, right? So tell us a little bit about what your what your responsibilities are, and maybe give us a quick overview of some of the science instruments on the on the Hubble. Um, well, we are responsible for all the science instruments on Hubble, as well as the computer that controls them. Um, there are five currently on board. Uh, the first is the Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS. Second is the Near Infrared Camera and Multi Object Spectrometer, or NICMOS. We have the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS, uh, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, COS, and Wide Field Camera 3, or, uh, wide field, or WFC 3. Um, My personal favorite. Of uh, course. We also have a sixth pseudo instrument that's the NICMOS cooling system that we use to keep the infrared cameras in NICMOS cool. What's in there? Is it, does that have like liquid nitrogen or something, liquid helium or something in That's there? That's actually cool helium, yes. Oh, okay. And, and uh, what temperatures do these need to be op kept at? Uh, when the system is operating, it's currently dormant right now, but when the system is operating, it keeps the detectors at about 72K. Nice. And, and things, why do these instruments need to be cold? Uh, well, if the, inst the infrared instrument especially needs to be cold because it's really detecting infrared radiation from, you know, the very beginnings of the universe, the cosmic background. Um, so it's it's looking at very long wavelength uh, IR imagery. Uh, so the detector needs to be cold uh, for that. It also needs to be kind of cooled and kept at an optimum temperature to keep uh, electronic noise from the detector uh, away from you know contaminating the image as well. Right. So the colder it is, the less noise and the less uh, thermal uh, signature it has to pick up. I'm, gl I'm so happy I'm doing this Hangout because one question I've been dying to ask somebody is, I've used telescopes a lot, and I've worked on telescopes on the ground in, in Chile and, and places like that. And always, whenever you build an instrument, a big concern is stray light. Uh, that's the light that doesn't, you know, it just kind of reflects off of stuff inside the optical tube, or it, it just reflects off of things in the telescope. How bad or how good is the Hubble stray light situation? I mean, are, is there a lot, of, a lot of it in there, or is there very little compared to, say, a, a ground-based telescope? What's the sense of that? Um, I can probably actually answer oh, that. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Well, because I'm actually the one responsible for focusing the telescope when um, <laughs> the, when the astronomers come back and say the, the telescope isn't perfectly in focus, I'm actually we, we have to command the secondary mirror. We actually focus the telescope by moving the mirror. You um, answered my question. I was just going to ask you how 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 that's done. Good. There you go. And, and then we actually move it by microns. I mean, they'll actually come and say we want the mirror moved by two microns, so two millionth of an inch. <laughs> we can wow. actually. We actually have it uh, twice enough. 
but to answer your question about straight light, Hubble is act, it, it's extremely baffled. Um, there are actually tubes within tubes um, to cut exactly down on that. Um, the inside of the telescope I mean, is can't really speak for the model, but it's got a very, very special black paint on it. I mean, that's made to not scatter light at all. We take great pains that you don't ever get anything bright that can start reflecting off on the inside. We actually can't. Um, we can observe very close to the sun. We actually have a very large angle that we can't get close enough to prevent any light from hitting any parts of the inside of the tube. So mainly, Mike, I need to interrupt you for just a moment. Can you please move closer to the mic? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, you're just at the edge where it keeps coming. Uh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no problem. And, and so mainly we, we, we keep the scatter light down by making sure we aren't having any sorts of external light entering the uh, tube by being able to point it, you know, keep it away from both the, the moon and the sun. All right. So so it, it's the baffles, which all telescopes have, sort of reduce this sort of reflectivity in there. Um, and so let's get back to the focusing now. So you move this. So there's a primary mirror. That's the big mirror at the bottom of the t of the tube inside that big cylinder. And then up toward the end of the tube, by the end by the by the cap that opens and closes, is the secondary mirror. And that is what you move back and forth in very tiny amounts to focus it. And you can do it on order of microns. What? How is that? That can't be a stepper motor. I mean, what kind of? How do you move things that way? Actually, there. There are six separate stepper motors, um, and they're, they're ganged up. There, there's three sets of two, and the reason you do this is if, if one of those stepper motors breaks, you, you want to be able to still focus the telescope. And so right. <laughs> they, they are actually re, uh, uh, redundant, so we have sort of three sets of two, but they are stepper motors, and they are just, just geared down to where each of our steps is actually we could focus less than one micron. We actually, our steps are about 0.6 microns, it's kind of hard because that 0.6 microns is very little motion at all, but we can actually focus. When we focus, we're only focusing about two microns. And the science instrument guys come back and they say, oh, yeah, that's much better. I mean, yeah, imagine that. <laughs> two million of in, someone saying, much better, much better. Okay, so this may or may not be in your purview, but let me ask you about flexor. We all know that the Hubble is in orbit around the Earth. It goes it goes uh, in bright spots where the temperature gets warm, and then it goes behind the Earth. It's dark and cold. So this 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 does does the Hubble do much of this expanding and contracting uh, over the course of an orbit? And do you, is it much of a worry when you're trying to focus it? Yeah, actually, the um the telescope doesn't do a lot of bending flexor because it's actually the thickness of it. It's all covered in the insulation. Um, and so we get very little um, thermal um, changes on it. And it's a graphite epoxy. It's a graphite epoxy structure to it. But what we does happen is it's called breathing. In the telescope, actually, it go it breathes in it. Secondary mirror will move a little bit in and out. Um, and that's actually, you see that as a function of orbital temperature. And that's actually something the scientists have to live with. Um, and they actually take it out and actually monitor the temperatures. And then so we know um, how to take it out from the science data. But it actually does change. Yeah, it, it's actually on the order of about 10 microns. So we're focusing within two, and the breathing is 10. So. Wow. So yeah, so that I can imagine that effect being really huge. And yeah. and so they have a way of of correcting for that after they get their images then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. it's actually very well modeled because it, it's, it's fairly well behaved and so um, they, actually, they monitor a bunch of the, the, the temperature uh, telemetry and then they'll actually be able to take it out from the data that they'll be able to correct the data on the ground they know it's out of focus by this much at this time. So I was just going to say that, that um, Mike just said something interesting. He said telemetry. So, in a, when you're getting images or science information, there's a whole bucket load of other parameters that come down from the spacecraft that tell you things like temperature, voltages, all that kind of thing. So, it turns out that that engineering data is very useful for parameterizing these kind of things when you're trying to calibrate your science instrument. You have to have all those engineering values. It's it's a pain, but we astronomers love to be, you know, get the best um, data that we can and correct for, you know, model and correct for anything we can so that we remove all that instrument signature or telescope signature from the data. 
So Morgan, in the in the description I got uh, from uh, from Mike, uh, to sort of describing what you did, he used the term herding cats. So I want, uh, I guess, what you what a part of your job is you need to make sure that when the engineers and all the different subsystems need to be either worked on or, or, or maintained in some way, you kind of coordinate that. Can you speak a little bit about that? Right, exactly. So if you have, you know, we have a lot of different subsystems on the telescope. We have the power subsystem, obviously supplying power to everybody. Scott's working on the science instruments. Mike and a, another group is working on the pointing and the fine guidance. Um, but really, it's a whole system that has to work together. It's a telescope, but it's also a spacecraft. Um, and you need everything to get the picture out at the end, right? You need the power to be supplying power to get the communications and the instruments all working together. So there are three of us on the systems management team that really try to make sure everybody's talking to each other, everybody's aware of what's going on on the telescope. Um, if Scott needs to upload some new flight software to one of the instruments, for example, um, that's going to involve the data management group that's sending up the commands and the flight software group that's obviously developing and testing the flight software. Um, so I'll be involved to make sure that everything's tested correctly, make sure that all the commands going to work together correctly, um, and just that everybody's pointing in the same direction and on the same page. So how much power does Hubble use? Let's say everything's cranking and you're doing an observation. How much power does it use? Oh, goodness. Oh, oh this is actually an interesting number. In this, this always amazes me. When, when we're running up with all the instruments and doing normal observations, we'll be pulling 80 amps off 80. our power buses. And now, during the day, during the day, the solar rays give us provide that. We for for 45 minutes every orbit. We've got like a 96 minute orbit. Half of it's during the day, half of it's in the night, roughly. For half that night, we pull 80 amps out of batteries for 45 minutes. Wow, that's got to be letting out some heat too. So I guess you got to protect from that as well, right? Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, uh, so so Hubble's up there. I'm not quite, maybe this one's one for Scott um, Swain. Uh, so we're up. Hubble's up there. You, you're you're doing some observations. Do the images go straight to Earth, or do they sit on Hubble for a while for a transmission period? They actually do stay on board for a limited time. Uh, there's uh, what we call buffer RAM in each of the instruments. So when an instrument collects a given image, it sits in its uh, its, its own buffer RAM for a period of time uh, until the solid state recorders on board are available, and then we can move that data to the solid state recorders uh, that we have on board. We have two of them on board. They're about uh, 12 gig capacity each. Um, solid state. The solid state drives, you mean? Yeah. So essentially, basically, solid state hard drives, um, and he about. 10, depending on how much data we collect in a day, uh, about 10 to 15 times per day, we'll dump those recorders to the ground uh, oh. and then get that data on, on the ground to be processed. So so let's talk about that. How, how much data does it generally produce uh, on average a day? Uh, on average, again, it's going to depend on what observations you're doing and you know, what the configuration is. Uh, but usually it's taking down about 25 gigabits a day. Right, because uh, spectrograph data that doesn't take up as much space as, say, a, a WIFC-3 image might or something like that. Yeah. What are the, okay, I just, this is a real nerdy question, and most people may not know, but I want to know. Uh, what are, what is the uh, bit depth on the, on the hip, the, the, the WIFC-3? That is, every pixel is, is it a, is it a float, is it a double? Because every, in a camera, in a CCD, just so you know, there are arrays of, of, uh, of uh, charges that get turned into a number uh, based on the the readout of the of the of the thing, and they can be bit, different bit depths. Those numbers actually mean something. They're actually a scientific unit. And I'm just curious, for my own my own sake, what are the what is the bit depth of the WIFC3? Do you know? Well, it's a 4K 4K detector. Um, right. So you know, 16 million pixels. Uh, exactly the depth, I'm not exactly sure. That would probably be a better question for one of the detector scientists. Okay, I'll ask that too. I'm just it just popped yeah. in my head. I, I know that some cameras they're doubles, in which case they're huge uh, images that come down, and sometimes they're just regular floats. So I was just curious about that. Yeah. Uh, so this okay. So is our is our largest image definitely. Okay, so in addition, Morgan, to the images that Mike or that uh, that Scott is dealing with or, or coordinating, there's this thing Carol talked about with telemetry. Is that a constant stream of data, or is it only coming with the other stuff? It's only coming with the other stuff, but as Scott said, we have all the recorders on board, so 
all the telemetry is recorded, and then when we get data back, if we go through a time when we don't have communication, when we get the data back, all of the telemetry comes down. So by the, by the end of any given 24-hour period, we'll have the telemetry for that whole day. So, so even if we didn't see something in real time, we'll still get it. You're not in actual constant contact then with Hubble, right? Right. Okay. right. Um, uh, close to 50-50 um, of the time when we can see real data versus the time when we're recording, and then we'll get the data back down. And you do this through, is it through the TDRS system? Yep, exactly. So okay, let's uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll have. I think I have. Scott uh, has a, a graphic of what the Tedra system looks like. Uh, Morgan, are you the one to talk about that, or should I ask Mike? Um, I think any of us oh, can. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so the TDRS, Let's talk. This is the main system that NASA has in orbit uh, okay. over the planet Earth that is designed to do what? So TDRS works not just with Hubble, but with most of NASA satellites. It tracks the satellites and then also relays the data from the satellites, which may be in low Earth orbit or various orbits, up to the TDR satellite and then down to the ground system. Um, so we don't the ground station. So we don't need to always be within view of the ground station to be communicating. And is there a primary uh, is there a is there a primary station that we use for Hubble or is it just wherever it happens to be in range? And um, the as far Scott, as oh Scott has it up now. Oh, great. Um, as far as the satellites go, we'll use whatever TDRS we're assigned, whichever we can see. And then the data for Hubble gets sent down to White Sands. Okay. And then transferred out here via on, on the ground. I used to live Sands. in Alamogordo. I didn't know that. So Hubble data goes down to White Sands. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yeah. yeah, I think Scott's got another graphic that actually shows um, the, the sort of data path. Yeah, there should be a data flow graphic in there that shows that path. Okay, while well, he's looking that up, um, so the the uh, the the Tedra system, which is not, as you point out, not necessarily just for Hubble, is used Here. for lots of other. I think the ISS uses it, and and anything in orbit that needs to communicate with ground stations. Um, uh, does this. Um, so, uh, oh, here it is. He's got it up now. So, uh, let's see. Uh, who wants to talk about this, Mike? Is this you? Um. Or, yeah, I, I I certainly can. I, I mean, okay. This is now, this is this is a schematic showing how data get off of Hubble, uh, and down to uh, Goddard. Yeah, we actually have what's known as high gain antennas, and those are the little antennas that are sticking off the sides, and we actually have to point those at the T satellites. Um, those are Hubble earrings. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> earrings. Um, and so our data goes to Tetris, and it, it it's a relay satellite, which means it just bounces it back down to ground, but the the nice thing about the Teeter satellites is they're always pointed down. They always go down to the same ground station at White Sands. Um, so that's coming down. You know, th that's radio communication from White Sands. It comes over here um, to, to Goddard. It, it comes across the data line, and then we actually ship it up to the institute. Um, so it, it's actually traveled the way down. And there's actually a significant enough delay. We actually have to account for the light travel time for the data coming down when we're looking at our clock signals. Oh, I can imagine, yeah, because it's high, it's, uh, it's high enough up, I would imagine. So what about that data link between uh, New Mexico and Goddard? Is that just a regular Internet connection, or is it something else? Uh, it, 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 it's a very high-speed bandwidth special, I mean, it's a special connection. It's a dedicated landline, you know, it's a dedicated data connection between us and them. So uh, I think that, if I remember right, NASA is upgrading TDRS as well, or maybe they already have. Um, but uh, this is supposed to give us, I think, more coverage and, and more capability as well. So how powerful are those little earrings there, those little dish antennas? Um, um, not all that powerful. I, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the... But they don't need to be that powerful since the satellite's not that far away. So. Well, right. And the thing is, we have to be able to point at the satellites. We actually have a only like a five degree tolerance. We have to have the little antennas pointed exactly where Tedris is. And we got to realize we're zooming around the Earth at eight thousand, you know, eighteen thousand miles an hour. And these Tedris are, you know, they're they're geostationary. They're they're stationary. So we have to be swinging this antenna as we're moving around to keep. Is in track, and that's part of what the computer on board does. It it knows where Tetris is, it knows where the telescope is, and it, therefore it knows how to move the antennas. So you take some observations, you gather some data, you fill up the so the solid state hard drives on there, and then you got to point it over at Tetris satellite to get it all off of there, right? 
Yeah, now, I, I mean, a, a lot of times when we, uh, if we can see, det whenever we can see the TDR satellites, we'll be streaming what we call real-time telemetry down. Um, as long as the TDR satellites aren't busy with someone else, they'll let us do our telemetry down. But we don't get science data down that way. All the science data comes down in the dumps. Um, and these are all scheduled out. There's a, there's a whole scheduling system uh, that figures out how, how and when to dump the tape recorders because um, and the tape recorders are great because you can be dumping them at the same time you're filling the other end of them. You're dumping the backside as you're filling the front end. But well, you have to is... they don't ever overwrite. Um, and so th that's all taken care of by our uh, ground system computers. <laughs> or, you know, it's all pre-planned. Everything that happens on Hubble is pre-planned to the second. I and mean, this is a command load we're sending up. We actually send up, okay, here's what you're doing for the next eight hours, or every second for the next eight hours is exactly what you're going to be doing. I just had this image when you said dump of not not very uh, scientific uh, terminology. Uh, ready for the uh, Hubble dump? So. The data, the data. Yeah. No, I just I, you are twelve. I, I, I am. I'm like twelve years old. I just I, I, I can't. I actually can't. had a, a question though that was brought up last week uh, in our past Hubble hangout, but I think it really ties in with the gathering the data and sending it back. Is where we talked about the South Atlantic anomaly and how you guys um, work with that. And if if uh, if someone could explain what that is and then what you have to do to compensate for that South Atlantic anomaly. Well, okay, I can take a first yeah. crack at it. Um, the South Atlantic anomaly is it's, it's a region of space where there's actually just just higher radiation than the normal, and so. We, and we actually happen to travel through it. Our orbit takes us through this Alpha Lambda uh, anomaly pretty much once in orbit. Uh, there are actually some orbits that don't because if you look at the way the orbit tracks across, sometimes we, we slip out of it. Um, and when we're inside of it, we actually don't do any observations because um, every once what happens is the computers will get what we call bit flips. A zero will turn to a one, and then they'll sometimes do something you don't want them to be doing. So we tend to shut down um, guiding. We just tell the telescope, wait until you're out of here and continue on doing what your observation is. Um, and so we sort of ride through the South Atlantic anomaly. You know, we sort of cover our eyes and ears and go, okay, we aren't going to do anything. There are actually some things that we can actually do through the South Atlantic anomaly. Okay, I want to I want to ask about pointing again. Um, the, does the, how so you, you you're in charge of the fine guidance system, which is responsible for keeping Hubble uh, very closely uh, uh, in line with what it's observing. Um, how do you move Hubble? Are there jets on it? Are there little little rockets at fire? What what makes Hubble move? You know, now, now that's actually a good one because I mean people don't you know this thing is the size of a school bus and you know about the weight of a school bus. It's the question: How do you move it? There are no jets. There are no gas. There's there's no propulsion system on it. What we have are what we call reaction wheels. They're very big, very very heavy wheels that we spin and. I'm, Imagine a lot of you people have been at science museums where you take, you know, the spinning bicycle wheel and you, you twist it on when you're sitting on the stool and it turns you. Well, it turns out by these wheels, they're, they're held at certain angles. When we speed them up, it actually causes the telescope to twist. It's conservation of angular momentum for you physics folks out there. Um, and so we actually move the telescope by spinning up wheels. And it, it's a slow way to do it. In fact, Hubble takes a long time to move. And, the fastest Hubble really moves from one point in the sky to the another is about the same speed as the minute hand on a clock. As as the what on a clock? You were as you cut minute it off. hand. On the minute hand. Oh, okay. Minute hand on a clock. And so for us to do a ninety degree slew, it takes us about fifteen minutes. Um, but we do it by speed by turning up these wheels. So we essentially we just speed up wheels in either one direction or the other direction. And they torque the telescope. Do it. And so we can do that. As long as we have power, we'll never run out of capability to move what, up. What speeds them up? Electric motors or what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. We're actually pulling power off the batteries and it, it's a motor. The, the, there's a computer on board that says I need to move it this direction. So I need to spin up. You know, there's three wheels that are spaced at different angles. And so it knows to spin the wheel one up this much, two up this much, three up that much. And that'll move the telescope and then it spins it down to stop them. Is there any is there any redundancy built in that system? Are there more than are there any backup momentum wheels or anything like um, that? No, but we actually have developed uh, ways we can run with two reaction wheels, and we can actually do it with one. You have to you can only point certain directions, and you, it takes a long time to get from one point to the other. Um, we only have one reaction wheel, but we've actually developed um, observing modes where we uh, 
can operate with more less than three wheels because um, they aren't redundant. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and any, all you hardcore space fans who followed me for any length of time, you will remember the first time we learned about momentum wheels was with Kepler uh, when uh, it had a problem uh, with it and it could no longer uh, complete its mission. As it could no longer point as precisely as it was originally designed, so they were repur they were considering repurposing it. I, I wonder whatever happened to that. I, I should follow up on that. Uh, anyway, so that's where we first learned about them. Hubble has them too. It's a very common thing. Um, Morgan, I want to get to you about commanding Hubble. Um, how do you do it? How do you tell Hubble what to do? Give us a real nerdy view of that. What's a what's it look like? A it's with authority she commands. Absolutely. <laughs> I command thee. <laughs> we we really have two different ways to command, right? So the normal everyday way, um, once a week, the Space Telescope Science Institute scientists put together um, their schedule, what we want to point at. How we're, what images you're taking, what instruments you're going to use, and they deliver to us um, usually on Thursday the week before um, the SMS, the servicing mission or the science mission schedule, um, and that gets loaded onto the computers here. And there's sort of two parts to it: one that controls the computer that Scott had mentioned, the science computer, and then the other that controls the 486 telescope computer. Um, so did you say 486? Sorry, what was that? Did you say 486? Yes. It, it's an as old... In, as in Pentium? <laughs> what? In, that's our upgrade. That's, that's our upgrade. <laughs> There's a 486 running the Hubble Space Telescope? Are you yeah, kidding me? Those are the fancy computers. That's there, right. Is there an AOL disk in there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a the big children? copy disk. We put it in. <laughs> oh, that's, that's brilliant. I love it. Okay. And that's the upgrade. What was in there before? That's 286? It was a two's complement uh, computer before. It was... Yeah. Uh, yeah, now, to be fair, folks, Hubble's been up there for 25 years. 25 years. It's been up there for a really long time. All right, so a 486 is in charge of Hubble. Okay. All right. So uh, throughout throughout the day, automatically, these commands are sent up um, in the normal course of things. Um, and then, if we have to do any real time commanding, either because there's a problem or because we need to change configuration or do something, you know, all sorts of different reasons. But we can also do real time commanding. Um, on the computers in this room in the room next door, and that's literally with one of the flight ops teams sitting down at the computers um, behind behind us, behind me, um, and sending the commands straight up to the telescope. Um, okay, but what are they typing? Are they typing go to M31, or are they typing in some uh, Python code? What are they typing in? Um, CCL is the, the language that we wrote, write most of the real-time commanding in. It's a, oh, um, it's, a, it's a special language then. It, yeah. So, uh, Command and control language, I think, is what CCL stands for, although I'm not positive. <laughs> it makes sense to me. <laughs> it's called CCS, or the Command Control Center System. Uh, the specific language is is, um, is actually it's based off of TCL, which is a standard language. Oh, okay, which is good. That. Yeah, I'd love to get into what a real-time uh, operating system is, but I don't think we'll have time for that right this particular time. But uh, So, yeah, so you're sending in a special command, and it's just a, a list. It's a, is it a text file? Do you encrypt it at all, or you know, can it be hacked? <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's all very, very controlled, um, as you can imagine, right? Everything that we send up has been tested many, many times. Um, so there's basically they're just mini scripts, mini programs, um, and so the flight op, the flight controllers will send, you know, L boot op two or whatever to transition. That's one of our commands to transition one of the instruments, for example, um, and that'll go through the sequence of commands to reconfigure whatever you want to be doing at the time. Okay, and how many people at a time are actually in that control room? Like over there next door, how many people are in there usually? Right now, zero, I think. Oh, um, that's not good. Nobody's driving Hubble? Um, a few years ago, we switched from 24-7 staffing. Um, for most of the Hubble's history, we've been staffed in there with about five people, 24-7, 365. Um, but a few years ago, we switched to automated operations. So now we actually have a computer in there sending up the routine commands and monitoring all the telemetry. And it's tied into an automated system that will alert us if anything goes wrong. So if we all have our iPhones and we'll all get a text message if there's a problem. Um, the flight operations team does go in there once a day to do some maintenance. Um, obviously, we check up on things all the time. Um, okay. But for the most part, 
it's automated at this it's point. Automatic. Okay, I want to get back to uh, getting uh, when the things go wrong in just a minute. But let me ask Scott a question here on the uh, the scientific instrumentation. Which of the science instruments on uh, uh, on Hubble are the most used, and which are the most complicated for you to have to deal with? In other words, which ones do any of them keep you up at night? As far as oh my God, I hope this thing you know doesn't break down or any of that. Uh, pretty much my job is all of them. Uh, if any of them <laughs> break down, it's going to keep me up at night. Uh, <laughs> when they break, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Always, and on Friday, too. Uh, well, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Christmas was was particularly exciting a couple of years ago. Uh, but um, no, all of them are pretty well behaved at this point. Um, it, it's funny, we, we definitely attribute a, a certain personality to Hubble and uh, each of the instruments. Uh, and we, we kind of joke that it, it, it knows when holidays and and, uh, and certain night times are. Uh, so it, it, it knows when to hit us. But um, the, probably the, the one that would give me the most consternation right now would be Wide Field Camera 3, just because it's the most used. Uh, of the instruments on board, uh, yeah, it, I can uh, imagine. Accounts for probably fifty to sixty percent of the observations that we do. Right, that's the infrared camera that right. takes all and those amazing pictures. And by the way, pictures. Tony and everyone, it's sixteen-bit data, and each pixel can accommodate seventy-eight thousand electrons when it's saturated. Awesome, thank you. Jill. That's a real. I'm sorry, but that's just nerdy. I, I love that stuff. That's what I like to hear. Sixteen-bit numbers. Okay. Uh, good. Well, there's the bit depth of the of the WIF C3. <laughs> okay, so your everything's automated. Hopefully, you've got a com computer in the in that other room over there that's a little more powerful than a 486 uh, controlling it. Uh, well, you said earlier, uh, Morgan, that you guys get text messages when something goes wrong, uh, right? That's the, that's your alert. What what safeguards are in place, and what do you guys do? when something goes wrong with Hubble. When something goes wrong? Okay, so we have literally thousands of telemetry points that are being monitored by the automated computer. Um, when it detects something out of limits, which is just however we defined it, you know, if a power gets, like, drawing too much power or gets too hot or whatever, um, the computer sends out really literally a text message to our iPhones at 3 in the morning or whenever. Um, and that's when me as the anomaly response manager will start to touch base with all the subsystems, um, make sure everything, every, well, not obviously everything isn't fine, but make sure that the subsystems are all expect in their expected state. Um, meanwhile, Scott and Mike and all the other subsystem engineers start looking at their telemetry. Like I said, sometimes we have real telemetry, real-time telemetry. Hopefully we do. If not, we'll wait till we get it um, and evaluate what the real problem is. Um, so there's two kind of anomaly responses. The first is immediate, and that's going to be sometimes taken autonomously by the telescope, um, and sometimes by very quick ground commanding to put us into a safe state. If we have a problem, we're not sure what's going on, we can just turn off some of the tech detectors. If it's a very serious issue, we can even close the telescope's aperture door, um, load shed power if we need to, just depending on exactly what the anomaly was. So we have an initial response to safe the telescope. That's our primary goal at that moment. Make sure everything's safe, no more damage is going to get done. Um, and then we can actually start trying to figure out what happened um, and if it's something that we can easily recover from or if it's something that we need to figure out how to reconfigure the telescope or maybe even a new flight software or a new um, switch to a redundant side or something like that. Um, that response is going to happen over the course of weeks um, rather than an immediate response. You're really going to take your time and figure it out and just make right. sure that you understand the problem. Well, that's good. Okay. So this safe mode that you're talking about, this is just an, uh, a configuration that you put the telescope in that is not pointing at the sun, not pointing at anything bad. It's, you know, you've just got to calm down a little bit. The instruments are, 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 are waiting you to figure it out. Do you ever have to reboot Hubble? Um, in, in a sense, one of the science instruments, the science computer actually... Um, Sometimes gets hung up, just locks up. Uh, kind of. Like that you, Scott? Did you do that? Yeah, it's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we had one of those recently, just back on the uh, the twentieth of October, uh, where yeah, essentially the computer just essentially stops responding to commands and stops sending telemetry. Uh, the first time it happened on orbit was really pretty scary, uh, since we didn't know exactly what state the science instruments were in. We couldn't get any information about them out of the, the telescope. 
Um, but eventually we figured out kind of what was going on and, and, and understood that the instruments were taking some action to protect themselves um, and put themselves in a safe state when they lost con uh, contact with the computer. Uh, but there for a while it was, it was not a comfortable situation to be in. So I heard a rumor. I heard someone a comment somewhere. I don't remember where. And this is for any any, any three of you, if you want to comment on it. The door out front uh, oh, is always open. You really are sort of loath to close it. I think, if, if for fear that it won't reopen again. Is that did I hear that right, or is that just something? Yeah. Yeah. No. And and and, and you're exactly right. The reason we leave it open is you know if you ever close it, chances are you know what if you can't open it? And boy, you close that and Hubble will not work. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing that's gonna go. <laughs> there's no way. And, and so we don't ever really cl we don't ever close it. The only thing that can close it is if the computer on board says something's wrong. I don't know where the telescope is pointed, or I can't control the telescope then it will close it. There is actually an autonomous closing. I mean, it's very rare. I mean, we've done it during the servicing mission. We've actually commanded it closed. Um, but, but typically, um, you know, we don't want to do that. Um, even though there, there's redundancy, there's, there's multiple motors up there to open it uh, up. But uh, it's really the only person who really closes the door is the computer when it goes into one of these safe modes. There are certain levels of safe mode. One of them is the computer says, I know what I'm doing, I know where I am, and I can control the telescope. But if, when we lose a gyro, or if we lose you know, one of the reaction wheels, it lost control of the telescope. It says, I don't have the control I need. I can't point it, so I'm going to close the door just to make sure because we can't ever get light down in here. Um, if the sun ever does shine down in here, really bad things happen. Right. And closing the door is a really good way to break the whole thing, even though everything, it could be working perfectly, but if no light gets to the primary, then you've got nothing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can understand that. So um, I want to address the gyros for a minute. Uh, really huge, important part of Hubble. Uh, what do they do? And they were recently replaced in Service Mission 4. It basically gave Hubble new life. Uh, basically, it's like the, the heart of the Hubble Space Telescope, isn't it? Who wants to tell us about those, the gyros? Well, I'll try. I'll try and do you, want, that. you want to try, Mike? OK, go ahead. Yeah, we tell us what that. they are, how important they are, and what they do. Well, the gyroscope are what what you think of as a gyroscope. It, it's they, they aren't very you know they aren't very large. They're, they have a very you know the spinning wheel inside of them, and essentially they they're very sensitive to motion. Gyroscopes tell us how the telescope is moving, um, and so we have six gyroscopes on board. Uh, we've actually been replacing pretty much every servicing mission. We we try to replace as many as we can. Um, these are actually mechanical gyroscopes. They're a spinning gyroscope that's spinning at at very high revolutions. Um, very extremely precise. Uh, these were probably some of the most the most precise mechanical gyroscopes ever made. Um, in fact, we, it was hard. You know, they don't make them mechanically this more and more. They've gone to optical and laser gyroscopes. Um, but what they do is they allow the telescope to know where it's pointing. The gyroscopes, when the telescope's moving, the gyroscope is feeding a signal saying you move this direction at this rate. So we've got six of them that they're all their their axes are pointed at different locations. So they, they let the computer know how the telescope's moving. Because when the computer's moving, it says, I need to move with the telescope 90 degrees this way. Well, how does it know what 90 degrees that way is? It looks at the gyros. So the gyros are the first way we point the telescope is we use the information from the gyros. Now, gyros are extremely accurate over small distances. They can actually hold the telescope. They are actually primary what help to hold the telescope. But if you do a big slew, you build up this little bit of error and then builds up. And so we have all these other instruments that allow us to fine tune the pointing afterwards. Um, but gyros, without the gyros, you can't point the telescope. Uh, but now we have six of them. Um, we've had various ones of them, you know, fail um, in different years. Um, we can actually do science, and for many, many years, we actually did science on two of them. Um, we actually have what's known two gyro, and we actually figured out a way we only need one gyro. To be able Good. To it. And it's because of these other instruments. One gyro, if you can get yourself onto the fine guidance sensors, you can do science. And we need one gyro to get there. It, it takes a little bit longer sometimes, but we only need one to actually do science. And so that, that's why we're thinking we're pretty good off still. I think it's a good point to put up that pickle diagram you were talking about. Can you uh, can you put that up uh, for us, Scott when you get a chance? This is a picture. It's uh, not a real pickle, by the way. It's something completely different. Not what you're thinking of. Call it pickles. Oh no, Hubble Hubble needs pickles. I mean, yeah. I, you know, 
But are they sweet? You know, are, are they dill? <laughs> yeah. Black butter? Here we go. Uh -huh. So this is an image of the, uh, well, I'll let you describe it, uh, Mike. Why don't you tell us what we're looking at? Okay, this is for, like, if you were in the back end of Hubble sort of looking out. This is how Hubble sees the sky. What, what you sort of see, you know, you see the stars in the background there. There's actually a galaxy in the middle, um, and you see outlines. Um, the big outline is the telescope. That's the entire area of sky the telescope could ever see. The um, little thing directly in the center, that's sort of what the wide field camera is seeing. Um, the other little circles to the sides, those are the other instruments. Those are part of the sky that they can see. Those big arcs on the edge, those are what we call the pickles because they look like bent pickles. Um, and that, I don't that, know about that, Mike. That's, that's pretty That's pretty big stretch, it, but go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think it was created by some software engineers who were, who were defining the name. It oh, that explains it. That explains it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but that's so the software engineer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to trust us as far as you can throw us. And right. so, so that's what the fine guidance sensors can see. So each one of those, you know, one's fine guidance sensor one, one's fine guidance sensor two, the other one's three. And you notice that there's star, there would be stars sitting there. And so what we do is we actually, these fine guidance sensors go out. They can move anywhere. They're kind of weird instruments. We can move anywhere around in that little arc or that big arc, in that pickle, as much as you don't want me to say the term. Anywhere in that pickle, we can actually go and find a star there and call what we say we lock onto it. So, like in this image, if you wanted to observe that galaxy, pick one of the stars in the pickle on the right and one of the stars in the pickle on the left, and you tell your fine guidance sensors, go out there and find these stars, lock onto them, and hold them exactly, perfectly still so that the science instrument can get its data. That's Using those Hubble, momentum wheels, right? Those that we talked about earlier, they keep us pointed straight. Or yes. is that just move? Yeah, okay. Well, well, no. They will move it, but they, they will also, yeah, they, they, they will move it, you know, finely tuned. Because you got to realize, we're spinning around at 18,000 miles an hour trying to point something out in space. We've got, you know, we're moving. We have to move to keep these things in. in, in well, how track. accurate does it do that? I mean, does it, can you keep the stars within a pixel? Um, we can keep stars within um, six milli arc seconds, within less than six milli arc seconds, a few milli arc seconds, so point zero zero one arc seconds. If if that makes you know. Yeah, that no, that's pretty darn accurate. All right, good. And it has to do that while orbiting the Earth. Yeah, Close. while it's going eighteen thousand miles an hour. That's um, right. I mean, essentially, it's like we're looking at a dime, a dime at the top of the Empire State Building, and we can hold Hubble pointed at that time. Nice, very nice. I like this picture because it shows all of the. Seems like there's a lot of wasted space. So, uh, what do you think about this, uh, Scott? Do you have any comments on this? We, I, we, we the, uh, uh, what are some of these other circles that uh, that Mike alluded to? Well, in the image that we've got up on the screen now, this is actually uh, the instrument complement we had before servicing mission three B. Oh uh, right, I, did, I just uh, saw that. Oops. The one that you've got in the center there is the the old uh, wide field planetary camera two, uh, which was actually a conglomeration of four CCDs. Oh, okay. Um, well, it has that shape. Uh, the in, the two circles uh, just to the above and to the left of that are the faint object camera. Uh, the circle and the uh, inscribed squares, those are actually the three NICMOS cameras that we have for the uh, infrared instrument. And those are still on board. And then the uh, circle with the square and then the X kind of inscribed in it, that's the, uh, the STIS field of view. So that's our imaging spectrograph. Okay. Um, if you want to go to the next, I think one of the next images that we've got in that package uh, there should be an upgraded uh, view of this field of view projection. Uh, it's not on the sky, but that shows. Yep, uh, the one back one. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, oh, okay, the good. Circle over there. It gives you the the upgraded fields of view with uh, with ACS installed that uh, replaced the paint object camera, uh, and then you, there you see STIS, and then cosmic origin spectrograph, which replaced uh, COSTAR, uh, which was our our, our optical uh, pointing correction. Instrument, so which is why you didn't see anything in the bottom left-hand corner of that that image we had up before, and then you could see the Nick cameras there for, uh, for Nick Moss, and then of course in the center we have wide field camera three now instead of WIPIC two. Are those flight and guidance sensors? Are they CCDs? No, they they're actually interferometers, um, which they're they're actually amazing instruments um, because um, they're the little Michelson interferometers, if you know what those are, yeah. um, actually um, have the bunch of mirrors in them that split the light and recombine it and allow them to extremely accurately grab onto point sources. Um, but 
Um, they can actually be used as science instruments. We always like to say, you know, Scott will say, well, I have all these science instruments. And I say, well, I've got three science instruments here because okay. each of the fine guidance sensors can actually be used to do science. And there's what's known as astrometry science that Hubble does. Um, in, That's um, the measurement of positions in the sky, right? Astrometry. It, you can measure very fine positions. Um, they, they turn out extremely sensitive to because they can. can uh, detect these positions and hold the telescope to within the, like small arc seconds. They actually can really find they find double stars um, really well. Uh, any stars um, even from the ground that you know people will say oh it's only one star it's one star Hubble will actually say no no it's actually two stars. You can actually you know, measure their separation and measure some of their properties. Um, it'll do actually really really high accuracy precision between one star and the next star and the next star and the next star. It's doing astrometry observations. So there was this thing a while back called the Hubble Guide Star Catalog. Was that made in using that, or was that something else I'm thinking of? That's actually made, I mean, people, you know, when I said, well, we were going to go back, you know, when we said, oh, there's that star there, well, how do we know exactly where that star is? The Hubble Guide Star Catalog is actually a catalog of, you know, many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of stars in very accurate positions, because we need to know exactly where those stars are to be able to tell those FGSs where to go to find them. So the whole Guide Star catalog is the guide to the star. Oh, okay, I thought, yeah, okay. I was wondering if it was related, but it sounds like it's yeah, not. So, yeah. Okay, I, I want to get to some, we're running out of time, and I want to get to some comments here. I have one from Daniel Nasato on the Q&A app. He is asking, do you think a private company like SpaceX might take over the maintenance and control of Hubble once NASA converts over to JWST, and perhaps set up a crowdfunding system like SLU for anyone to point Hubble. Sure would be cool. It's a great idea. Uh, Carol, is that something you'd want to comment on maybe? or? Sure. Um, so just for all you fans of SpaceX and Elon Musk, Elon Musk has actually received quite a bit of NASA funding to get his little enterprise um, off the ground, as we say. So he's not completely independent of NASA, number one. Um, and number two, uh, this kind of exploration is and, and use of scientific instruments is really um, something that requires a national effort and a national will. And so like a lot of the ground-based telescopes are funded through the National Science Foundation because it's very hard for private institutions to afford such facilities. Now there are a few cases in the old days of ground-based observatories that were, were very capable that were privately funded by people who had a lot of money. But in, when we start talking about sending rockets into space and then uh, putting astronomical instruments on them, it's very difficult. So maybe sometime downstream it might be possible to privatize. But right now, NASA is really the only um, name of the game and note, you know, the science part of NASA is not for profit. And in fact, we, we give away all of our data. So to then start talking about commercial space um, and then applying that to scientific research is really scary for people like me because that means that the costs are going to go way up and it's not going to really be possible for many of us to to do the science unless it's federally funded and we have this arrangement with the European Space Agency so it's two very large agencies putting together their resources and expertise so that scientists can do their research so I, it's an interesting idea but um, it, it, it does require significant resources and expertise to to keep these things running and you're only you're seeing three of the great experts on Hubble, and there are many more. Right. Yeah. So it's a, so it's a very expensive endeavor. Good. Well, good point. The other thing um, to out there, if, if Tony, I think there's definitely going to be good overlap between JWST and Hubble. So it's not like once JWST is on orbit, Hubble's just going to get turned off. Uh, okay. Forever. Hold that thought. Exactly. Hold that thought. Hold that thought there, Morgan, because Sorry. Bork Vanderbilt. Be <laughs> The Q&A app is that we get this almost every time. How long are we going to keep using Hubble? Why would it stop being usable? Uh, continue, please. <laughs> Great question. Um, we're going to operate at least until 2020. Um, like I said, we're really hoping to get a few years of overlap between Hubble and JWST. So we can Both telescopes can be observing the same thing and get data from the different instruments. Um, uh, you know, my instinct is that we're going to be able to operate longer than 2020. Um, certainly, as instruments die or as the gyros die, 
Um, the capabilities might be lower than they are right now, um, but we have a lot of contingency built in. We have a lot of engineers working on all sorts of life extension projects to keep Hubble going just as long as we possibly can. So, What about the second part of that question? Why would it stop being usable? What are some of the things that would make it um, no, not, not a thing we can use anymore? Certainly, like Mike said, we have science modes that can operate with one gyro. Um, so the gyros are one. So the gyros are one. Um, if all of the instruments uh, end up having, we've had some power issues on the instruments historically, so if the instruments just stop not being able to, op literally not get power. Um, Mike certainly gave you one of the doomsday scenarios of we go into a regular safe mode, we close the door. Um, so there's lots of different things that could go wrong, um, but we have multiple layers of redundancy built in, so we'd need lots of problems built upon okay. them. Well, that leads me, I'm sorry to be rushing, but I'm running out of time. I want to make sure I get to some of these. Uh, that leads me to Tony Lynch's question, which is, how do you, this is another limiting factor on Hubble, uh, how do you keep Hubble in its actual altitude, in its orbital al altitude? How do we keep it up there? What do we do? No, it, it's actually... That's right, it's just sitting up there, isn't it? <laughs> and, and it's actually slowly falling down. I mean, the trouble is, this thing has very big wings on it, and these things, I mean, even though we're at, you know, 340 miles above the atmosphere, we get atmospheric drag. We are slowly coming down, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, and, you know, you, that is the most life-limiting thing. I mean, what, it will deorbit, um, and so, but that's out, you know, the estimates now are pushing that out, you know, 2035, something like that, before we come down by ourselves. Right. So, and I think the limit, the outer limit on that, is somewhere around the mid, uh, mid, mid twenty twenties, uh, where that might be uh, a real problem. So, um, so yeah. So that that's another limiting issue. Um, so here is. Uh, oh, let me just, let me just respond to this comment. Shunga Four is asking, is there any way to rewatch this once it's over? Yes. This will be archived on our YouTube channel, Hubble Site channel. Which, if you haven't subscribed, you are wrong. You need to go over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. <laughs> You are how do you feel? How do you feel about that, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Go subscribe. That way, you'll also be notified of any future hangouts on air. And, and also, I just wanted to shout out too. We just broke four million followers on Google Plus, so thank you all on Google Plus. And make sure to follow us over at Twitter. We're at Hubble Telescope. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Michael Jobin. One final comment, and then uh, so you don't torque with the CMGs. Uh, you don't torque on the CMGs with actuators to move it. CMGs, what are those? Yeah, I'm not sure, um, but but no, to move it all, we just spin the wheels. I mean, so yeah, you just spin the wheels. I so, think CMGs yeah. is cool mini gremlins, and no. <laughs> CMGs. Oh, you said it cool. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite sure what those are, Michael, but thanks for that. I know, and so, yeah, there's the momentum wheels that are they're solely responsible for moving. Uh, any, am I forgetting anything, Scott, that I haven't looked at the queue at the uh, Hubble or the YouTube? Nope. At the YouTube? Um, I'm thinking the only thing here, uh, Twitter actually has been great, and a lot of our questions has been answered Thank you, Twitter. already. So, yeah, it's been great over on Twitter. Um, lot, uh, let's see here. There's more of comments, you know, so... For you guys, for our amazing guests, uh, lots of thankful comments of actually understanding how Hubble works. So this one is from Darth Oxilius. Hubble is a beautiful series of instruments. This video is helping me to understand the fascinating simplicity and complexity in the structure of the telescope. Thank you. Which awesome. awesome. Thanks for that. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is a good question, uh, maybe in general. Uh, this is from Chris Marshall here. It says, uh, if there was, let's see here, um, if there was a spacecraft available to service Hubble again, what changes would you make? Is there anything that you guys would would change? I'd get a new computer. <laughs> a new computer. <laughs> Maybe do a Pentium class or something. Uh, hey, don't fix what's not broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good philosophy. Right. Good. Probably the science instruments. I mean, the the. The ability to change the science instruments is really what has, has given Hubble the long life and the ability. I mean, if you put a new science instrument up there, the whole yeah. telescope becomes new. Yep, that's so what if, happened. So if you could only put one thing up on Hubble, even if, say, you had lost half your gyros in one wheel, you would put a science instrument up there because it's going to give you more science. Um, yeah, and I would say that if we were faced, well, if we had an opportunity to do that and we were pretty confident that um, WIPO Camera 3 was going to continue operation. I think the science community would like then maybe to expand the UV capability because this is the last telescope 
for a very long time that we'll be able to look in the ultraviolet. Um, so that we're going to lose that capability when we use Hubble. And in fact, we have noticed that the number of, there's a whole campaign, but the number of proposals that have uh, gone in have emphasized some of the ultraviolet capability. But the great thing is to have the wide field camera there, not only with the UVIS, but, but the infrared capability as well. So it's, it's all of that together. So we have to think as a science community what really is the highest priority. So uh, I guess Elena looked it up and said CMG is control moment gyroscope. So uh, I guess we just mm -hmm. don't call it. Call we it don't that. call it that. Yeah. So I guess that's what that CMG is. Uh, okay. Well, um, I, th I think that's all of it. I think that'll yeah. conclude this week's uh, this week's hangout. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank our guests. You guys were awesome. Absolutely. So thank you all. This was a lot of fun. I've been dying to learn about the nuts and bolts of the Hubble Space Telescope and how it's operated. So thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time out to join us from Goddard. Um, and uh, Carol, next week, all it says is Abel twenty seven forty four z equals ten. Um, that's that's a Frontier Fields. Uh, it's Frontier Fields. It's a you. discovery of a very very distant galaxy using um, not only the standard techniques of measuring its color because it, we can't measure its spectrum, but it's also studying the lens model and that this object was found by examining the lens model. So we'll be able to really talk about, okay, we did these clusters, we know their gravitational lenses, now how do you model that and what can you learn? So I think it'll be pretty cool. And also tune in to see what Z equals 10 means. So Z we, equals that, 10 means it's that, really <laughs> far away. <laughs> yeah, that is really far away. That really, is, really far away. So we'll get a Frontier Fields update next week on Thursday, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, so we hope you guys will, will tune in. Thank you all for watching. And as always, keep, keep looking. looking up. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.